so now I'm just going to jump into the to the chat. I see we've got a few a few questions coming in, um, and um, I might I might pose this one to um, I might pose this one to Roger. Actually, uh, what are the best ways you've found to bring public and townies like the townies? Um, uh, bring the public attention to the positive work and mahi that you've been doing on the ground? Uh, yeah, it's a good question, um, Tom. And, and, you know, we do a lot of water testing in ours. We're doing over 70, 70 testing sites in the Rangitiki, which is a huge number. And not all of them are brilliant stories. So you've got to manage that. Um, and But you've got to make the community feel welcome. Um, and that's the iwi as well. Um, it's, it's, and I got told off when I was presenting once, so I didn't invite the local plumber. And he said, because he relies on us as an industry, so he's part of our community and they're all storytellers. But you've got to make it, uh, you know, if it's all secret squirrel stuff, it's not going to go anywhere. So you've got to welcome the public uh, and the public is everyone, um, whether it be the fishermen, the local boaties, the, the plumber, the schools, whoever. It's getting the community involved because they're our storytellers. And uh, it may, they may not come to every meeting, because uh, they probably won't want to come to every meeting, um, but they definitely should be definitely invited to one meeting a year to learn about the successes of what's happening in a, in a community catchment. Great, fantastic. Thanks, Roger. Um, we've got another one here. Um, someone's keen to set up a local group, but surely this should be under the wing of a larger catchment group. So um, maybe maybe Lloyd, I might ask you that question there. What are your thoughts on, on that? Should, it, um, should they go it alone or should they be sort of an under umbrella type situation? Well, I, th I think I think you need to do both, Tom. To be honest, so if you've got a small group of farmers with a common goal, you've you've also you've got your own little weed catchment group. Now, the issue that you have, and that's where you get the big yards. You got to you've got to work from your tributaries and work out, start at the ground and work wider. So once you've got your grounding there, then you can use. You probably need a wider umbrella group to help you take it to the next level, which is getting your funding and starting to develop projects and things. And you, the wider group is there to help you, not to drive you. So it's really because it's all about getting every, no, one size doesn't fit all. So you've got to go down so that you're actually getting what's best for you and your group of people. So, yeah, so, so the answer is treasure your small group, but you do need to probably get to a wider group to be able to, to move forward and to access funding and to, and to set up some, you know, good, some good trials or, Good mitigants. Great, thank you, Lloyd. That's that's a fantastic answer. Thank you. Um, and there's one here for you, um, Emma. I might just see if you're able to answer this one. Um, someone's asked about um, engagement with iwi and Ronanga, um, and particular around Tamana Otiwai. And Emma, I know you've had some some really great engagement lately um, around that um, around that area. So I wonder if you could sort of expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's an, and my broad thoughts on that because I'm going to talk more about um, regulations and those interactions um, probably later on. But like my broad thoughts on that is to to find Tamana O to Y. Why not be part of that like at ground level? Because if you can define what it is there and you're all agreeing on it, then that allows you to um, find those common goals around what it actually means. And that might be bold because I know there's probably a lot of different opinions on that, but that's my that's where my value sit on it is to just keep trying to build that relationship. And if you've got that relationship or that partnership, then that leaves you to be part of that defining. And that's really hard, isn't it? Uh, and maybe Emma, I'll ask you this one. What are some suggestions? And, and you've already covered some of these things, but what, what are some specific things um, catchment groups could do to build momentum within their group? Yeah, it just, um, it comes down to, like, as Lloyd said, ownership's really important. So if someone's got a cool idea, just get behind them, just let them do it, like, roll with it. Like, even if it's not about water water quality or water quantity at all, just get them behind them and, like, get that positive vibe going. Like, no idea is a bad idea, just get them behind it and support it. And when you've got that positive vibe, like you've, you're actually building an environment where other people actually want to be part of that. So um, yeah, that would be that would be my initial thoughts. Great, thanks very much. Um, and we've got another one here. 
um, how, how do you determine that you have enough momentum? And maybe Lloyd, I might come to you on that one. How do you, how do you establish if, if things are going really well or, or not? So how do you establish that? Oh, that's an interesting question, Tom. But one, uh, one, of the, one of the great moments in the former Haka, and, it's, and the, it comes from hearsay, but that was, uh, it was probably a couple of years ago when all of a sudden there was discussions in the local hotel about environmental stuff as opposed to landing descents and charming rates and this and the next thing. So what happened was we, we got to a tipping point when all of a sudden what people were doing on their properties for the environment become a become a topical point to talk about. So it became mainstream. And that was when all of a sudden if people were buying, starting to buy into it. So that's when you knew you had your momentum. And then all of a sudden the momentum actually it should it's, it's not actually up to the catchment groups to give to make the momentum. It's for the people on the ground to make the momentum. Okay. So it's like it's part of a big long journey. So so you know, I, I think that's really important. That's all. It just comes down to the ownership because all of a sudden it's the farmers talking to farmers and, and then you start to get that snowball effect. And then what happens, you get the snowball effect going. You just got to be really careful that it doesn't get cut from underneath your feet as well at the same time. And that's when you get outside people coming in wanting a piece of the, piece of the party, I suppose. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, Tom, thanks I'm going to jump in and break your structure. Yep, go right? for it. You go and for I'm going to answer Emma's question and Lloyd's question. Go for um, it. Because they're both really important. And uh, like so, some of the things we're doing, I've got a whole list here of things we're doing in our community catchment groups. And they range from water testing, um, water sampling, macroinvertebra, um, looking, at the, looking under the rocks, seeing what's happening. Our farmers love doing that. We get an expert in. Um, we get, we're getting a preliminary assessment done from what we could grow and do in our area by planting food. Um, that's costing us a chunk of money. Um, we're doing farm planning workshops. We're doing greenhouse gas workshops. And I've had farmers ring me up and said, gee, Roger, that was fantastic getting that expert in to help us get our, over, get our greenhouse gas number one-on-one, um, -on -one, um, which is all coming from MPI and MFE, which is fantastic. Um, you know, we're controlling weeds, old man's bed, but we're basically, we've got one community thing that's decided they need a cell tower. So that is what they're doing as a community in their sub catchment group. They're getting a cell tower together. So there's no rules. It's doing what a community wants. And as Lloyd said it in one, farmers, um, farmers, uh, farmers need to drive it. They know what they want. They've got to look at the vision out further, what's going to make their, their community prosperous and, and also enhance the environment. Um, so yeah, really, really important. The, the other thing about success of community catchments, I, I don't think we need to beat ourselves up that we need a meeting every month or every three months or every six months. As long as the community has a vision and everyone's on board, they, um, we have one group up at our way that had four meetings a year. Well, I'll tell you what, they soon dropped off when they had four meetings a year. So success is it's, it's, it's doing what we're talking about, looking at the long-term vision and looking after our environment. But success is an interesting thing to measure. Um, there's, no, there's no rules. Um, it's community driven, bottoms up. Um, and as long as the community, community understands what you're trying to do, they get on board big time. Fantastic, thanks Roger. Um, and so seeing as you're just talking there, we might, I might just get you to talk about, there's a question here we've got in the chat. Um, how do you manage subscriptions to get buy-in from everyone in the catch and, catchment? And so maybe, maybe, Roger, you can have a crack at that. Yeah, right. Well, that, that, that's fascinating because we're charging our land landowners to be part of it because I don't think the government's going to keep fronting up forever and a day. Um, and we're charging a bit of money every time and not, a, not all our farmers are paying. But um, I've been involved... Um, I'm involved with a with a with a soft. There's a number of software groups which are trying to get involved in community catchment groups, but there's one that's been set up, and I won't say its name at the moment because it's very early 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 stages, which is 100% focused on community catchments, and it is going to be a magnificent tool because the farmers will input their own data and stuff into the into their at the farm level. We will then be able to bring it up to a community level and up to and up to a um, uh, bigger level still and see what we're doing in our community. So if we have a farmer um, who is not involved, their farm is going to stand out big time when they are 
um, comes up in the community meeting and there's there's two or three farms that aren't and aren't coming up in the community catch in the in the sub catchment map so that that's a tool coming that we're going to have coming for going forward um, it's going to be a very valuable tool um, but I but the other thing is I don't think we should uh, get too concerned if a farmer isn't involved in a group um, it might be circumstances it might be money it might be uh, change of generation whatever this, but we've got to remember this is intergenerational and sometimes people will change. They'll, 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 you know, it'll be a light bulb moment to say, shucks, that group's doing a great job. I'm going to get involved. And then they, then they end up leading it. So I don't think as community catchments, we need to beat ourselves up if we've got two or three farms which haven't been along to a meeting. Um, they will come. Uh, you know, we all have barbecues. We all have meetings and everyone's talking about it. And all of a sudden they realise that they're not. Um, so uh, yeah, it's um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's it's something that evolves over a lot of time. You know, it's not if we get if we put too much pressure on ourselves, we will burn out. There's no doubt about that. So it's a it's a it's yeah time thing. Great, thanks, Roger. Um, and uh, maybe Emma, I might ask you this one: What are the pitfalls from the from the chat? What are the pitfalls to avoid in setting up catchment groups? Maybe you've got a few little insights in there. Yeah, it's, I think, get your vision, and I think we've covered a lot of this, right? Like, I think it's get your vision and values clear, and that is hard when you're working across a really diverse, a really diverse group, but when you find that joint vision, you're finding that sweet spot of what you all agree on rather than what you don't, and also go easy on yourself because, the, building those relationships across a diverse group, not just farmers, wider stakeholders, community, everyone, that takes a whole lot of time. And so don't, I wouldn't push it, like they will come, as Roger said, people will come eventually, whether they be stakeholders, farmers, um, but you've just got to allow people time and allow that that um, word of the community, voice of farmers and um, voice of wider to actually just seep out and sink in and let them come and and they will fantastic have you guys have you other two lloyd maybe if you've got any insights on that one as well i know i think that's really i think that's really good i think it's something that i learned really early on from janet gregory and that's what she told me it's um we're all on a journey and everybody's at different stages on the journey so you got to be careful you don't get away too far ahead and expect people to be where you are so you got to let people come on board. And I think when you're setting up a group and you, you know, you don't expect everybody just to jump on board. It doesn't matter. People are at different stages. And I know through the Palmer Hark and some of the people that, you know, that were, were probably anti and now some of the most proactive ones, you could say, it's just because they're coming along on the journey. And so um, one of the, um, the pitfalls of setting up a, a, the catchment group is you got to, when you're setting up your visions and your values, which I think is important, but you need to make sure it's quite wide because you need to be able to, you don't want to have your cash flow group being restricted at all. You just want to keep a really quite fairly you know wide framework so you can move within your framework because because when you're only there in that moment of time, and then over time your priorities are going to change or you're going to get movement to and fro. So you know just if you're setting up a a, a cash flow group, you know. Got to be prepared to go with the flow and go with what's needed, not what, not what other people think you need. Great, yeah. thanks, Lloyd. Um, we've just got one more, and I might just briefly just do a, just a round table, um, just to give us give us very briefly your thoughts. Um, the question is, how dependent is momentum on external funding? So, just quickly, your thoughts. I might start with you, Roger. It's not. It's as simple as that, Tom. As far as I'm concerned, in fact, we were very, very close to telling MPI where to go. Um, with their last sort of funding because the rules and regulations around it and what they wanted to see from us uh, was, was over and above um, what, what, what is reasonable, we thought. That we came to an agreement in the end and, and backed out. Um, I just want to add, this is off, off top, topic, but it's thing, community catchments, we don't want to get too serious about this stuff. This, this thing is all about being social as well. Um, it's not all about going along and and we must learn something every time. It's going along and sharing a beer um, or a wine or whatever it may be. One, one thing we promote in, the, in our community catch with Rangtiki is there must be a social thing every time. 
it's got to be a barbecue and a beer or else what the hell do we all want to go along for? Um, you know, we, you can only learn so much about planting trees and, 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 and protecting um, waterways and things. Uh, that'll happen. That's going to happen regardless. Um, but it's a social side as well, which is really important for community. Um, so, yep, we don't need, we, we have to learn to survive without the support of the government. Um, hopefully they'll carry on supporting us for a little while. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, it's really exciting what's going forward. Great. What about you, Emma? Any any brief things you could add to that? Yeah, no, Roger's right. It's not like um, we probably, as a community group that had absolutely nothing to start with and then went to a $6 million project in a year, like um, there are groups that are nailing engagement and momentum better than us. And a lot of it is around um, that, what, what's been talked about, right? Like that, um, just that engagement, like people just coming together around a common issue. It's, it's not just around money and be careful. And I say this with like, we're set up now, so we've been through it, but be careful what you bite off to chew because it's a hell of a beast in terms of reporting. And um, that is money that actually takes away from outcomes. And that's a hard pill to swallow as well. Absolutely. Lloyd, any brief things to add to that? Well, no, I think they're both, I think they're both right. I'll tell you what, is it? You, yeah, no, I think both are right. Um, you got to do you got to do what's right for your people, and sometimes external funding is really good. And I will say, we the Palm Market got significant funding for our riparian planning program, and that was set up initially as a as a corridor planning program, so planning the, the you know the main streams and stuff. But then when we got the money, you could tell it wasn't going to work because we had the money for the wrong thing. We had the money not for what the people were wanting, so we actually went back to our farmers. Um, back to our farmers and our stakeholders, and so the, the money's actually got re-diverted, you say, but the, the priority was to be doing planting where we got the best environmental outcomes. So it's gone to the, the tributaries of the tributaries, you could say, because it's not about, that's where we're getting the best dollar for our money when it comes for our output. And so we just went back to the funders and, you know, and they're all pretty happy with that because it was like a universal thing. but. We, I think it's it's too easy to say um, we don't need the funding to keep momentum. I probably don't 100% agree because if all the funding was pulled tomorrow, we'd all be pretty flat for quite a while, I'd imagine. So we actually need, but we need to work out ways of getting consistency of funding rather than just going on a three-year lolly scramble. And you know, it's like, so we need to get, we need to get fund, we need to get a different funding model. And I think Roger, like, Roger's, you know, what Roger's saying with the subscriptions or it's going to be, you know, in the Pomahaka people pay um, and they're quite happy to pay. We don't expect everybody will, but the ones that do are happy there because they're contributing to the catchment group cause or what the, the values and the visions of the group is. And, they, you know, they may not go to very many meetings, but actually doing it because they're part of the, they're part of the movement because of, and there's people that don't pay subs that are still, they're still part of the group because they're doing what, what we're doing because the neighbours are doing it and it just builds on each other so you know it's not um you don't have to have the funding but in saying that you do have to have the funding you, know, you have to have some funding because we because we have all got day jobs as well so yep. we need to have some funding to do the organization and stuff Tom, just I, just, I, 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 just, I just like to back lloyd up you know i said we don't need the money we, we employ two and a half people so you, you can work out what we pay them um, it's it's a great job, but they've still got to be funded. And we we are not sourcing enough funds internally to be able to pay them. So we do need some funding. And the other thing I think we need to point out is this is a learning curve for the government as well, for MPI and MFE. And so I don't think we've got it 100% right the way we're doing it. Um, but the financial support is definitely appreciated. Um, it's, it's how it's being... Uh, provided at the moment. So Lloyd, Lloyd's bang on. We we don't want it to go away tomorrow. That would be dumb. Um, but if we end up depending on it solely, uh, we're in trouble. Um, so it's 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 a learning game going forward for both both parties all around. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, chip in there, like um, some of the conversations I've had is like instead of getting the big bulk amount of funding that we've got to subsidise everything, just that seed funding, which can pay two or three people to just coordinate everything. Um, sometimes that's a more productive way to go because you don't get that complete load of admin and reactive like pedal pedal to keep up with things. 
Great, that's that's really good. That, that was a really interesting question, that last one, and it's really prompted a good discussion there. Um, just in the interest of time, we might just go just to the third part of our session, which is um, which is all around um, balance. And so, Lloyd, I'm going to kick kick this um, this part off with you. So, what role um, does um, what role does, uh, oh, sorry, so, so burnout's a, a real risk for catchment groups and individuals. And so where's, where's that balance point between doing too much activity and not enough? And we sort of have covered some of these things, but we're just really interested in your perspective and things that you're doing in the Pomahaka. Well, you know, I think we probably have covered quite a bit. So carrying on, I think, um, we first we've got to start, we always start, well, I always start with the farmers. So you've got to have farmers talking with farmers. So you've got to, you need to have the more farms you got involved, um, the better. So, like we have a committee of like twelve, so there's quite it's quite a large committee. But there's um, not everybody's active at the same time, so we've got people coming and going all the time on the committee. But we also need the people on the committee that you know they're on the ground. We you still need to have somebody that it is like they like you need somebody that's going to organise the events and do the admin and make the phone calls to the key farmers. But you, so you still need, and, and I think it's that facilitation role of the one that's really, is the key role going forward because um, the, at the end of the day, we're all, the farmers are all busy people when it's just, they're keen to do stuff, but the organizing is, is not so easy. So you need to have the, you, I think it's really important for burnout. If you don't have that key person, you're gonna try, you're gonna, you get one or two people trying to do everything and it just doesn't work because eventually they will just get sick of it. I think um, um, it's when you don't, it's when you, um, you get burnout also when all of a sudden, um, when all of a sudden things don't go your way or, the, or basically what I'm saying is you get somebody comes in with roles or you get, or you get unhelpful organisations that are sort of standing in your road and making it, you're making your, you know, making your improvements because what happens is you you get you're getting there in a group and you're doing really well. Then all of a sudden somebody comes and puts a bloody spanner in the works. It's like, what the heck? What are you guys on? That what you're doing is not going to help the environment. What we're trying to do is helping the environment, helping the environment the future. Because you're more worried about rules. I'm more worried about the environment. Or you um, or you're more worried about processes or whatever. So I think it's really I think it's something we need to. I think the whole industry needs to understand that it's. Don't expect people, you've got to let the catchment groups do what they're doing because otherwise they won't exist at all and they will burn out. And I think, so the key thing that we, the key thing is, is we're creating like trees all the time. So you've got like your committee and then you've got like your key group people in each catchment and then you've got your, you know, the key ones coming down. So you get your ring tree sort of sus. So you've got to spread the spread stuff wide and far and you've got to be prepared to do stuff like Roger's saying, um, over a cup of tea. If you make it so you're trying, if, you, if you're trying to do like hardcore planting project based stuff all the time, people get sick of that, eh? So you just and the and the and you get burnt out trying to organise it. I'll tell you one thing in South Otago that we did um, for a wellness one. We just um, you know around COVID and stuff like that. I see Rebecca's on the call. Rebecca got a hold of Mr Whippy. We took Mr Whippy into the country, and we just had. 12 stops over two days or whatever it was. And the people came out and they all had a chat. And the good thing about that is people came out that don't normally come out and they come out as families. Because remember how what a, the catch, the, this journey we're on is for the whole family. It's a generational thing. So and we want to keep everybody involved. So so that's, you know, to avoid burnout is you, you know, you just got to spread the, you got to spread spread the load the best you can, but you do need to have that facilitation, that input of people who can organize things. Um, writing funding applications is plain exhausting, and that's, um, you gotta have a pretty um, pretty big head of steel to do one of those. And it's like, it's, um, you know, the, the funding is a funny thing. When you, it's like you get something that works and then they don't want to fund it the next time. It's, um, so you just gotta, so you need to, whether we need to get people in to help doing that, I'm not too sure, but when you get burnout and when you, and you know you're getting burnout because you just lose your, lose your will. And we, you know, around the NES when they're doing those, we lost our will for a while because it got all taken away from us. Because, so the burnout, 
if things are going well, you never get burnt out. Like you're getting engagement and people are coming. It's when you get something, you know, when you don't get, things are going well, you don't get burnt out. When things come in from the size that upset you, you get burnt out. I and mean, if you get that burnt out, you've got to go back to your roots, which is a cup of tea and a barbecue or a few beers and you get, get down to your groups of 10 or a dozen people and you may or may not talk about the environment stuff, but you're talking with your neighbours because it comes to a wellbeing thing as well. And you've got to always remember, you know, one side, we're here because one size doesn't fit all. We always argue, we don't, one size doesn't fit all. And even, you know, every farm is, a, every farm is different. So you've got to break it down to those small subgroups and then you've got commonality and then, and then you can move forward from there. And if we can promote that, we get people out on a regular basis having yarns with their neighbours and yarns with their farm discussion groups, well, then we're winning. We're always going to win because the whole, whole group, everyone's involved. Thank, thanks very much, Lloyd. That was that was a fantastic answer. Now, just, just brief, Roger, I'll just come to you on that one as well. Where do you think that balance point is? Uh, yeah, okay. Lloyd didn't stick to three minutes, did he? But never mind, I'll get on. Oh, can't be far away. No <laughs> way. Way over. <laughs> Way over. Hey, um, the balance point. Well, we're really lucky. We've got three talented people involved in the RRCC uh, employees. Um, when, since they've been involved, um, uh, it's made a huge difference to the committee. Every Everyone in our subcatchment group is the chairs of all our subcatchment groups are allowed on the committee, uh, but we only have uh, six people that are regulars um, that have been on from the start. And we have a Zoom meeting every uh, two weeks three weeks and we our staff are on that um they tell us what's happening we talk discuss things um what what our, our committee is doing myself um chair and other people uh or, or sub chair um we're getting other sub catchment groups going is what we're doing we're going around like we spoke uh at Tutanui last week got another sub catchment group going um we're going to the halcom hall or the halcom pub getting another sub catchment group going um, that's all we do. Uh, our groups drive themselves. Um, as I said, as far as burnout goes, uh, one of our passionate people, um, uh, Mark Crystal, he's, the, he's my deputy chair, um, when he got started in the Mofonga area, they had four meetings in a year. Well, that was getting close to burnout. So they're back to two. Okay. Um, and at the end of the day, if I go back to uh, my opening thing about what success is about, it's about catching up. Uh, educating, bottoms up, um, a vision for the community, allowing others to tell our story uh, and regain the trust of the public and the government as from us as farmers. If we're doing that, that's success. So let's not beat ourselves up and say we've got to have three meetings a year or five meetings a year or whatever. If, it, if we can do that with one meeting a year, fantastic, because this is intergenerational. Um, and uh, yeah, we definitely don't want burnout. That's the last thing we want. Fantastic, thanks for sharing that. Roger and Emma, I'll, I'll come to you yeah. um, just on that nasty. question. But um, Lloyd, I'm really sorry that was nasty because it's such, a, it's such an important thing and you, um, you, re, um, you told us really well. And like for me, it just comes back to um, it, what's your passion? People join these volunteer groups because they're passionate. And when you're passionate, it's so easy to get stuck into things and lose track of everything else that's going on around you. And then you will burn out. And like, um, and, and always like, there's a box, right? There's a whole box. And like that stuff that Lloyd talked about of what you can't, what like what's hard, put it in a box of what you can't control and put it to the side and, and be aware of what you can control and what you can't control and stick to the stuff. You might be able to influence some of it, but stick to the stuff you can control and in that positive mindset, positive zone, and that will reduce the impact of burnout. 